about you, some of you my age too, also remember that we listened to a lot of music and we like to pawn this off by saying, oh, I wasn't listening to the words, I just liked the music. And we can sing the words word for word and then we sing them. You get in the car and children help you do this. You probably talked about this. You turn the radio on and now you got a three, four, five, six year old sitting in the back seat and this song comes on that you remember that you really like because you like the beat and then you start listening to the words and you went, turn it off! Because now you realize it was ungodly. The lyrics were just simply, plainly ungodly. We can do better. And even this year in our daily Bible readings at Lakeview, we're reading the wisdom literature, Job and Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. And wonderfully applicable teaching from the Old Testament books. Do you remember what Jesus said on one occasion? He said, the queen of the south will rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. As much as I enjoy reading Ecclesiastes, am I reading Jesus? Are the words of Jesus again in, in my heart, in my mind, even to the point of who am I quoting? When Jesus was tempted in Luke chapter 4 and Matthew as well, how did he respond to the temptations of the devil? Three times he quoted Deuteronomy. Three times he quoted Old Testament scripture. Three times he quoted Moses who was speaking for God. In essence, he was quoting his father's words. What do you do when you're challenged? How do I respond? What? Who do I turn to? What philosopher is going to help me through the temptations that come my way? In whatever form they come in, where, who do I turn to? Am I turning to Jesus? Am I quoting Him? Shouldn't we be quoting Him? Before I get too far, I've, I have filled sermons with the quotes of men. I enjoy, there are some good quotes. But why are they good? They're only good because they perhaps for a moment help us appreciate something that God has already said. Not for our glory, not to glorify men. And I've I got to tell you, I'm just finding my brethren, some, reading so much and that sounds hypocritical. I don't have a lot of books. You can come in my library, and I remember one young man coming in there and said, have you read all of these? I said, no. And he probably asked me, why do you have them? I said, I don't know. <laughs> Preacher's supposed to have books. I see a book, I like the title, buy it, put it on my shelf. But I've read a lot of them. And not all of them are written by people that I would invite here to come and preach the gospel. And I may have learned something now and then from some of those folks. But again, what I'm, I preached a sermon years ago in, in, Lilburn, in Lilburn. And it was a lesson on family values and I was preparing it for another place. And I guess the first 15, 20 minutes I had filled the lesson with statistics and quotes. And in the last 15 minutes I talked about what God says about family. And I had a fellow come up to me after very kindly and said, Lee, I think you got that backwards. I think he was right. What am I trying to fill the hearts of my hearers with? You, my brothers and sisters and, and people that visit. I want you to be filled with the word of Jesus. I want you to leave here thinking about the words of men. And who are we giving glory to when we quote others? When we quote Jesus, we're giving him glory. He's our Savior, our King. We honor him when we quote what he said. A few years ago, I went to hear my brother Bill Hall preach. Bill's been a mentor of mine. Many of you knew him, knew, knew him. He preached here a couple times, I think, a meeting while we were here. 
And I'm sitting in the audience and he quoted me. You know. And it wasn't a big deal. It was a reference to a passage I had mentioned to him sometime before that. And I guess made him think about it and he saw something in that passage and he quotes me. And people come up to me afterwards and said, Bill Hall quoted you. <laughs> of course, I'm over there, chest, chest all puffed up, you know. He quoted me. Just quote. It's what it does. It kind of lifts us up in pride a little bit. I'll tell you something else we've got to do. And Peter made this very clear. And I like to talk about this one so I can encourage all of my older brothers and sisters for just a few moments. Because I'm there, sort of, maybe. <laughs> Don't want to admit it, even though I'm in Medicare now. I'm not sure how that happened. Don't laugh, Samantha. Samantha's not funny. Therefore, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know them and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. We need to be reminded. And sometimes I think we forget things that really doesn't have a whole lot to do with our old age. I did see a report one time, read a study, that this fellow determined it wasn't necessarily because our brains deteriorate as we get older as much as we have accumulated so much information that when we want to recall something, it's like a computer that's full. The hard drive is full, and it's slow trying to find what you're looking for. I like that. <laughs> I'll accept that definition. But sometimes I think that's absolutely true. My mind is so full of this that when I need to recall this, it just doesn't come to the forefront of my mind as soon as it would have if that had been my focus, if I had filled my heart more with the Word of Christ. If our hard drives are too full, we need to delete some files and make room for some more. Now that I've kind of reproved you a little bit, no more than mine, I should have taken my shoes off. I was thinking about doing that since I was getting ready to step on some toes. Because nobody's toes need to be stepped on any more than mine. Worship, assembly, coming together. What do you do when you're just kind of dragging a little bit? What do you do when you think it's not as enthusiastic? Your own worship is not enthusiastic. You're not necessarily criticizing everybody else but you look at yourself and it's kind of dull it just you don't sing the song with enthusiasm They're the same old songs the sermons about something you already think you know about the lord's supper we're thinking about the same thing every first day of the week and you feel like you're just kind of going through the motions what do we need to do change it up change the order in which we do things May I suggest that you ask yourself this question in Colossians chapter 3. By the way, if you haven't figured out, the sermon comes from a study of Colossians. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Can we admit something maybe? That maybe the reason we're not singing with grace and in our hearts, teaching and admonishing one another with some zeal and enthusiasm, is because the Word of Christ does not dwell in our hearts richly. I think that's a parallel, by the way, with my brethren interested in what the Spirit's doing in our lives. Don't be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. 
speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's the, 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 the parallel Ephesians passage. I suggest to you that being filled with the Spirit and the words of Christ dwelling in your heart richly are parallel. I'm not asking the Holy Spirit to come in my life and do something supernatural or miraculous to get me stirred up so that I can worship the way that I think God deserves. No, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And that Spirit has given me His Word, the Word of God, so it can fill my heart with it. And you'll find yourself singing if you like you've never sang before. And I don't mean necessarily it's loud or it sounds great, but in your own heart and mind, you will truly be engaged in worship to God and be thinking about one another as we sing to each other. It will enhance your worship. Folks, if Sunday's the only time we open and read or more likely listen to the Bible, can we expect worship to be edifying? And worship is supposed to be edifying, 1 Corinthians 14. That's the purpose of us doing what we do together. And edification centers around the words that are sang, prayed, preached, taught in an assembly. Read 1 Corinthians 14. Edifying is, the, is kind of the, the basis of that chapter. It's, it, it just comes up four, five, six times. But in the middle of that, Paul is urging them to, to speak words that they understand. And so you fill your hearts with words that you understand, the words of Christ, and I'll tell you what will happen. You will worship the way you want to worship. Romans 15. Would you describe your life full of joy? So here I go, you know, I've got sports il illustrations all day long. <laughs> I had a fellow tell me one time I was using too many, he's probably right. I know a fellow had season tickets to the University of Tennessee football. I've been to a game or two in Tennessee. It's a happening, about 105,000 people dressed in orange. If you like Rocky Top, you're going to hear it about 40 times. But it was just a fun atmosphere. When I was talking to a fellow who used to have season tickets. He gave them up. You know what he said? He said he got tired of his happiness on the weekends being determined by the performance of 20-year-olds. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean everybody's the same way. I understand that. But I... I wonder sometimes, and I've been there. You know, I had season tickets, we had season tickets to IU football from 86 to 93, the glory years. And Betsy went with me till the middle of October, and then it got cold, as long as I took her out to eat in Nashville on the way. <laughs> and then Chuck come along, and he went with me. I remember one year that Indiana looked like they might even have a chance to go to the Rose Bowl. They were about four and one late in the season. They played at Illinois and they had a 12 point lead with four minutes to go. Illinois scored two touchdowns in the last four minutes to win the game. I went outside and I started raking leaves. Bessie come out and said, are you okay? I said, just go back in the house. <laughs> Leave me alone. You know? And that was a Saturday. I, I hope I preached like I needed to preach Sunday. <laughs> I know you don't remember that. And I remember a bowl game I was watching at Bill and Mary Walker's. Probably about 1990, Greg. It was a Liberty Bowl. Scored a touchdown late to beat South Carolina. You know how often Indiana went to bowl games and how often they won them. And I went over the coffee table when they scored that last touchdown.
what I got segue off into that is if that's my happiness, is the success of the teams I root for. It's pretty shallow. And you fill in the blank. What 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 is it makes you happy? Not sports, maybe it's movies, maybe it's music, maybe it's buying stuff, maybe it's collecting things. You, you just fill it in. And I'll fill the blank in with whatever Solomon talked about in Ecclesiastes. And at the end of the day, he says, none of it lasts. And it doesn't. Now, I'm thankful maybe as we mature, we can just sit back and enjoy a game and maybe and after it's over, move on and go on to more important things. Joy and peace and hope are found in filling our hearts with the words of Jesus. And on a more serious note, those things can be found in the most troubling circumstances we find ourselves in. Jesus said, the words I speak to you are spirit, they are life, John 6, 63. I'm afraid sometimes we are trying to find joy and peace and hope in things outside the wisdom of Christ. Jesus says, fill your heart with me. Be full of me, full of my words, full of who he is, full of his character, and become more like him. And that's where joy and peace is found. Romans 15, 13, or joy and peace in believing. When my faith, my trust in God, that's where I find lasting joy and peace in believing. Are we really listening to Jesus? Let me assure you of something, and the world misses this, some religious folks have missed this. That you're listening to Jesus when you listen to Matthew, when you listen to Mark, when you listen to Luke, when you listen to John, when you listen to Paul and Peter and James and Jude. When you read them, you're listening to Jesus as well, okay? Not just the red letters, but you're listening to all the revelation of the mind of God to us. We've got folks who think they're prophets. We have folks who think they're spiritual Paul said, if anyone thinks himself to be a prophet and spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 14, 37. There are a lot of people in this world claiming to speak for God. I studied with a man in Nashville that he got caught up in this, wanting to hear the voice of God. And what he meant was, when he prayed and he was looking for an answer to a prayer, he was, how do I know God's answered that? How, I want to hear his voice. And while that may have some challenges in dealing with that concept, I've heard of folks who want to hear the voice of God but are not listening to the voice that's already been revealed. This was kind of, I thought, a funny meme. Somebody on Facebook put it said, I just wish... God would speak to me. And somebody in the back seat said, read your Bible. He said, no, I mean aloud. And she said, read your Bible aloud. <laughs> <laughs> but we want God to speak to us, and here he is. This is how he speaks to us. And it never gets old. And the older we get, the more we love him and love what he had to say. And you know what? That's true about relationship with people. We love the communication. Are we listening? And are we, but, but, but now wait a minute. Are we only listening to the things that we like? Be careful. Are we only listening to things that make us feel good? We get caught up in a, I call it a um, devotional mindset where, you know, somebody wants to read passages that, and there, there's a place for that. There's a time for those two. Where it just makes us feel good. Makes us feel good that God loves me and cares about me. And all of that's absolutely true. And sometimes there are moments that I need to hear that. But sometimes I need, I need to hear the corrections. And sometimes I need to hear the reproof. Sometimes I need to hear a rebuke from the Lord. J.D.'s getting ready to do a whole series on the, sermon, uh, on the letters to the churches of Asia. Have you read those lately? 
I mean, Jesus told the church at Ephesus, you've left your first love, and if you don't get it back, I'm going to pull the candlestick. I will no longer recognize you as my people. Then there are about five churches that he had some things, while he pointed out the good things, he said, there's some things here you need to change, need to repent of. Laodicea, you're lukewarm. I need to hear that. We got a fine young man, a father, a while back, and I didn't say anything to him, and it's not a big deal, but he said, I really enjoy reading the Sermon on the Mount. And I kind of said to myself, are you really reading it? <laughs> and maybe what he meant by that is he does enjoy it. He loves to hear from the Lord, even if it challenges us. And if you can still read the Sermon on the Mount and not be challenged, you're, you're beyond where I am. Good for you. You maybe need to be. It's challenging. So don't just read the, 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 the stuff that makes you feel good. The things you put on your stencil on your wall or you put on a little blackboard or put inside the cover. Your just make sure you read the things that challenge. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The words that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. I'm not going to be judged by the words of men. I'm not going to be judged by the philosophies of men. You're not going to be judged by my words. I preach this sermon and think, Lee, if you're not careful, you're going to preach yourself out of work. I think as a brother in Christ that I'm just with you and we work together and my job, my responsibility, my, what I want to do is encourage you. And I want to see what I need to do and encourage each other. And just point you in lessons like this. Not that so you can go home and quote what Lee said tonight. If you want to quote me tonight, this is the only thing I want you to quote. Lee said we need to be filling our hearts with the word of Christ. And then when you get done with that, I want you to do it not because I said it, but because you love the Lord. You know, I look at verses like this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, that's that commercial. That's that my treasure, what I value, what I love, what I search for, what I will read, what I will study, what I will. I probably did things 30 years ago you don't even know what I was doing. Not necessarily bad things. 1987, I had a metal detector. My dad had a metal detector. And I knew he had that, and so I would go up to total strangers and say, can I dig holes in your yard? And I think the best thing I found was a 19, uh, 1887 penny. I remember it because it was 100 years old. Do you know what copper looks like if you left it in the ground for 100 years? You know what it was worth? I'm not sure it was worth one cent. <laughs> but I worked at that. I, you know, I'd go out and do that and bu hear that buzz and to get my strong screwdriver and dig that up. Hoping that someday I was going to find the mason jar in the backyard with the metal lid on it that they had put their coins in, you know, and buried it in the backyard. That's B.C., before children. And so was a lot of my participation in sports. Where's my treasure? What do I value? What do I love? What am I looking for? What, I, what, will, I, what will I spend hours and money and energy searching for? Is it the word of God? A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil, for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. It's just, it's just full in here, and it just comes out. 
Let's fill our hearts with the word of Jesus. Please. I need to hear this. The ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. That's God's definition of a good and honest heart. He hears the word and he does it, keeps it. I need this one. He said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Why are we still buying things? I mean, 65 years old, why am I, why am I buying more stuff? What, what's the goal here? Why am I accumulating more things? To leave it to my kids who won't care about it? Some of, some of the things I buy, they won't care about. Is my life about what I own? Is, is there my reputation based on the house I live in, the car I drive, and how much money I have, the kind of vacations I can take? I hope not. And I don't think you hope so either. What's your life consistent? If my life consists of the things of Jesus, then that's enough. Invitation. That's Jesus. I didn't say that. It's so hard sometimes. We're teaching folks we love and trying to bring them to Christ. And They've grown up with a religious background that's taught them that, well, they were saved without being baptized, saved at the point of faith, saved when they were sprinkled as children, as infants. And all of these traditions of men that have permeated the hearts of men and we're just trying to point them back to what Jesus said. That's all we're doing. Sadly, sometimes, as one preacher said, he read the passage to a woman and she simply looked up at him and said, that's just your interpretation. He just read it. That's all we're trying to do. And I'm urging you tonight, and me too, to fill our hearts with the Word of Christ, study it, think about it, meditate it, let it become your life, put it into practice, and then try and make every effort to teach it to others. So people walk away thinking they believe this book is from Jesus. They believe this is the Word of God. My mentor, Bill Hall, made the statement to me once. He said, Lee, that's what preachers do. We preach from the Bible so that the audience actually believes we believe this. And if you, if you communicate that, you've done a great thing. And I hope tonight, maybe in some small way, I've communicated that to you. Thank you for listening. Let's sing a song to encourage each other. Fill your hearts with the word of Christ. If you're not a Christian, he tells you what you need to do. Why not submit? Do what he asks. And then just, just get after it. Just study, read, meditate, think. And you'll find some marvelous things happening in your life that you never realized could happen at all. Will you come as we stand and as we sing, please?